It's the next level. I don't recognize my face in the mirror. My voice when I speak. I used to try to resist you, but now I can't remember why. Do you? My husband's on a business trip. Tell him I love him. Not to come back here, ever. I'm exhausted. No, you're fine. You're fine. You're all, you're all going to be fine. And you let us sleep. We have your nightmares. No, that's not true. I've, I've kept you safe in here. You, you feel, you feel at peace. We feel your pain. No. Your grief is poisoning us. No, stop. Please, let us go. Let us go. This is going to be a spoiler-filled episode of Season 1, Episode 9, WandaVision, which is the series finale, apparently. Series? Of- what do you mean, apparently? You knew full well as much as I did this was a series <laughs> finale. <laughs> yeah. The, eh, well. There were a number of people out there, though, that were like, series? And I'm like, yes, series. Like, we knew from the start this was going to be a one and one done. off. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, the synopsis of this Season 1, Episode 9 series finale is the events of WandaVision come to a head and the destinies of all of those who took part are determined. So, what were your overall thoughts of this particular episode? So, I watched this when it released. Yes. I stayed up till here on the East Coast, 3 (laughs) a.m. And watched it. Yeah. Because I felt like I needed to. Yes, you did. And I, I'll be honest, after my first viewing, I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I was satisfied, but I felt it a little lacking. Yes, I felt the same way. But then I watched it again, and I loved it so much more the second time I watched it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then I watched it a third time, and I hated it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I loved it even more than the first two times. And a lot of the emotional notes that were in this episode really hit me oh, yeah. on they the run third through. viewing of this. Like, yeah. I, I cried on my third viewing of watching this. Yeah. Yeah. So, overall view of this episode, I am 100% completely... Feel, uh, left feeling fulfilled and satisfied for what this series was trying to accomplish. Yeah, I, I felt the same way. I woke up literally at 3.06 a.m. in the morning after we <laughs> logged off, after we were playing games that night, and I was surprised that my body just woke me up, and I started it knew. watching. It knew. It knew. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I wound up watching it. I was falling asleep through certain points, like my mind was in and out, and then I watched it during the day, during my break at work. And the things that kept me up while I was watching on the first viewing were very pinnacle points. And a lot of the pinnacle points for me were the emotional points and the action points at this point. Oh, the action points. Oh, they were, they were amazing. They are so good. It's like if, if Marvel Studios did it in the cinematic world, they definitely did it in this show and they proved their point where they could actually bring it not just within the cinema realm but they brought that to the tv realm or Mm -hmm. netflix realm or disney plus realm at this point so they could actually get everything out there so to me they got a good story at first i was like "Ah, there's so much lacking i wanted so much more you know, we all wanted so much more. We were all thinking and theorizing what our thoughts were. And a lot of them were pretty much right there 
in front of our faces if we watch from if we binge watch it from day one till day end. And now we get this final outcome and it's like, oh, it's right there in front of us and we didn't really see it. So I, I really enjoyed it. it. It took about, like you said, about three watchings to actually grasp and contain all this information and feel, you know, and you stated it before with uh, our friend Craig and it was the five stages of grief. Mm hmm. And, you know, and he was correct in that aspect when he was talking about that online. I feel the same way. And I think that Wanda is on another journey at the end of this. And it's amazing what we're going to get. I'm going to dive more into that as we talk a little <laughs> further, too, because that, that. that is one of the points that I have about this episode. And it really is one of the main points in the reason why. I ended up feeling the way I felt by the second and third viewings of this yeah. and loving it as much as I did. Because, I mean, let's be, let's be completely honest. This of every Marvel property that has been out there, mm -hmm. I think it's safe to say WandaVision has been one of the most theorized yeah. properties out there, as in people theorizing who is who, what's going to happen. Exactly. There were so many theories out there. And every week, those theories <laughs> proved wrong. Exactly. They, they happened to us. I mean, I, I unfortunately wasn't able to make last week's episode with you and Damien, you know, but the past weeks that I've been on too, like I made a theory and then I even said next week that theory will be wrong. Yeah. And the next week that theory was wrong. And I think if there are people out there disappointed in this finale, it's because they were hoping so much that at least one of these theories would pay off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and in reality, none of them paid off. None of, None them, of them paid off. Nope. Nobody got it right. Nope. But what they gave us, it took me some time to kind of sit with it. Mm -hmm. And the, But once I realized what it was, and I'm kind of, I know I'm being kind of vague because I'm going to talk about it later in my points. <laughs> because I know exactly what I feel this show gave to us. And I'm going to talk, yeah. like I said, I'll talk about it later. Mm -hmm. But what it gave us in the end, I feel was so much better than what we would have gotten had any of these theories played out. Exactly. We could theorize till we're blue in the face, but Marvel could just come back and smack us with their own version and go, wow, I never even conceived that. They can, they can smack us in the face with the dark hold and, <laughs> and we'll just shake it off and keep theorizing. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, we should move into our top fives, I think. Sure. Roots. In a given space, only the witch who cast them can use her magic. Thanks for the lesson. But I don't need you to tell me. Who I am. No. 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 I'll kick it off, I guess. Yeah, sure. All right. I'm going to do this one just because this one makes me laugh every time I think about it. <laughs> My number five mm -hmm. is Paul Bettany being a cheeky British bastard. Yep. <laughs> So last week, unfortunately, I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't on the podcast, yes. but there was that, I talked two weeks ago about that interview that Paul Bettany did mm -hmm. about how there was still a cameo coming. It's somebody he always <laughs> wanted to work with and he's got a lot of scenes with him. So at the end of last week's episode, when white vision is revealed, it mm -hmm. took me about five minutes, but like I, I thought about it and I'm like, wait a minute, the cameo is you. <laughs> <laughs> you cheeky bastard. Yep. The cameo is you. And then a couple days later, he was interviewed again and he revealed, yes, indeed, the cameo I was talking about was me. I hope that doesn't, I, I hope that doesn't disappoint people. And it did. Like there are people out there that were disappointed because yeah, they expected, they expected strange or Magneto or somebody. Cause we even theorized it was going to be strange too. Yeah. But when I thought about it, I'm like, I'm not mad at all. Like, that is like the epitome of British humor. That is. 
So when the when the cameo turned out to be himself, like saying like he always wanted to work with himself, I'm like, that's <laughs> that's bloody brilliant. Like that's, that's ballsy. <laughs> you you just became one of my favorite people ever. <laughs> he had a, <laughs> doing that. He, he he had the bollocks to do it. Yep. <laughs> but on, but you know in in regards to that with Paul Bettany being like his own cameo yeah. and, and in playing both Vision and White Vision. You know, I got to say, just to further my point for my number five, man, this the vision versus vision stuff oh. was phenomenal. Oh, I know that. And that that's actually my number one. And we're not going to go into that yet. But OK, then I, that's all I'm going to say about it. And I'll wait yeah. till we get to your number one to dive deeper into it, because my my number five was more. It was more the Paul Bettany call, be, calling himself his own cameo. But it does lead into the vision versus vision. But if that's your number one, we'll save it until we get to number one. So, but that's yeah. my number five. All right, cool. Uh, well, my number five would be, uh, well, Pietro or Pietro or Ralph, Ralph and Monica Boner. and his man cave. <laughs> and we found out that he was someone who was an actor at one point, probably a failing actor at this point. And he was hexed by Agatha to play the part of Pietro. And we get the whole, you know, his real name is Ralph Boner, as he actually stated, which is pretty funny. Honestly, oh, come that's on. Uh, they, they, everybody theorized that Evan Peters was Quicksilver from the Marvel or from the yep. X Men universe, yeah, or the he Fox was, universe. or he was Mephisto, or he was all these other people. And in reality, he was nothing more than a dick joke. Exactly. <laughs> but I loved it. But the, the awesome thing was, is that Monica was able to break the spell with just breaking the necklace on around his neck that Agatha put around there. And I don't recall ever seeing that necklace. In any other scene beforehand. I think what it was, because I thought about that too, and I think what it was is that in every different reality, whatever it was that was around his neck, mm -hmm. the totem that was keeping him under the spell changed in every reality. Okay. If you remember in the Agatha All Along video, the glow is coming off his jacket. Yes. So I think it was his jacket that at the time that was the thing that was controlling him in the Malcolm in the middle one, he was wearing the beanie for a lot of it. So it could have been the beanie that was controlling him. I think it was something different in every reality. Hmm. And then when it got to modern times, it was, it was the necklace. Uh, the other uh, little aspect of it is we never did find out if it, if he was the missing person that Jimmy Woo was looking for. No, we don't find that out at all. At all. That is something that is completely tossed to the side yep. in this. Yeah. It is never revealed who Jimmy's uh, witness was. Informant. I actually have that as one of my notes. I have no witness as one of my notes. Yeah. Because it's never revealed who it is. It's still completely... It'd be really interesting to find out who it was later on. It was Agatha all along. <laughs> <laughs> Fits the motif. It does. Uh, your number four? My number four is... I want to talk about Monica for a minute. Okay. In that, this is something we talked about when Greg was on a couple weeks ago, in that mm -hmm. we were, you know, when Greg had mentioned Monica's eyes were turning purple when she looked at Pietro before, and I theorized that, no, I think her eyes changed to the color of the energy that she is interacting with. Yes. And I think that was pretty confirmed this episode. Okay. When she comes through the hex and first becomes gets the photon powers her eyes are blue and yeah. she's looking at the spectrum of color from the television when she looks at pietro her eyes are purple because that is the color that of agatha's power mm -hmm. and then later on in this episode when um hawkins not hawkins hayward hayward is trying to shoot the kids and she jumps in front of the bullets she's absorbing kinetic energy this time which is yellow mm -hmm. and her eyes turn yellow so her eyes are indeed changing to the color of the energy that she's interacting with. Blue was the spectrum of the television. Purple yes. was the witch or, you know, the whatever powers that Agatha had. Mm -hmm. Yellow is the color of kinetic energy, which is the color that her eyes turned at that time. All right, cool. So I think it's pretty, I think it's, it's a pretty good observation to note that I think it's pretty much confirmed her, her eyes change to the color of the energy. All right. Well, uh, that was your number four. My number four would be Wanda's confrontation with the townspeople when Agatha breaks her spell. They basically attack her verbally with stating that they feel Wanda's grief when they sleep all the time. Mm -hmm. And then she lashes out like someone who is suffering depression 
and then choking them with her magic. Then she lets them go and starts to break the walls and tells the people to go because she she feels okay. She's starting to realize that it's because of her that these people are suffering. <clears throat> and then uh, she goes, and then Agatha states, uh, "Use your powers and let them go. Heroes don't torture people." And she winds up. She goes tells everybody go at that point and they all run and they scatter like crazy yeah which was like a, a good divining point for these people and for wanda at that point it, it shows that you know she wasn't doing these things pretty much intentionally i i think that a lot of her awareness of what was going on was around the time of the kid's birth i think she was more aware at that point when she gave birth to billy and tommy at that mm. point, because she saw the dead vision, she started realizing this is something that was in the back of her head, a subconscious thought. And that's just my thought. No, I, I agree with that. Um, I One of the other things I, I really, I took from that whole thing is, you know, again, one of the things that we've, people have theorized with this series over the run of all, you know, the whole nine episodes is that who really is the big bad? of this series you know people like we said people were theorizing it was mephesto i i heard other options nightmare. you know yeah nightmare was another one yep. you know hayward was a villain and hayward really was a villain in the end as he was, was yeah as as was agatha but one of the things i really took from this too is that there was in essence a third villain and it was wanda wanda was the villain of her own story yes she was it wasn't intentional, but she, in the end, turned out to be the villain of her own story. Which makes me think she will probably be the villain in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. I think I think you're right. I think it is going to be a Wanda versus Strange situation. I don't think that's how it's going to end. No, I think there's going to be another. There's going to be a third party involved with the. I think just like we pre we've been predicting with yes. Wandavision, there was a third party pulling the strings. I think that's absolutely how it's going to be with Doctor Strange and the and the Multiverse of Madness. One of the other things too, I want to note too, because you brought up that line is that heroes don't. When Agatha tells Wanda, heroes don't. What was the line? You said it. Heroes don't take hostages. Heroes don't take hostages. So it's it's similar to that. Yeah. Um. Whatever the line is. Agatha Harkness in the, and this is something again really interesting. I liked that they did with this series, um, you know, because we had even mentioned Agatha's really not the villain. There's somebody else pulling the strings, and it turns out in the end, Agatha really was the villain of this story. Yeah, which threw people a little bit because in the comic books, Agatha Harkness is a mentor to Scarlet Witch. Yep. Well. Big she time. still kind of was. Yeah, she this. did. She was teaching, and she taught Wanda about the spells of, you know. She taught Wanda about the runes. Correct. She taught Wanda about, I mean, saying that, you know, heroes don't take hostages thing. Mm -hmm. Like, she was teaching Wanda unintentionally. Yes. She was teaching Wanda the whole time. Wanda learned from Agatha. So in, so in even though they they gave you the twist of Agatha being the villain, Agatha still turned out to be a mentor to Wanda and can still be a mentor to yes, Wanda. Yes, because she knows where she's at and she spared Agatha and just gave her the role that she was meant to play or she chose to play while within Wanda's world. Oh, this is not the end of Agatha Harkness. Oh, it it's not. Uh, she's going to be back in yeah. Doctor Strange, I think. I, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it's in Doctor Strange that we see her return. Because she says, like, you're going to need me. And Wanda's like, I know where I'll find I know where to find you. Exactly. And that was foreshadowing. Oh, Very yeah. Very much absolutely. like what we got foreshadowed with the runes, what what Wanda did, and I could go into a lot more within a lot of my top fives as well as my Easter eggs <laughs> of what's going on because there's a lot going on within this this episode that was foreshadowing from the very beginning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what's your number three? My number three. What is my number three? Oh, here it is. Uh, um, oh, I can cross that off. Sorry. I'm, I'm keeping track of my notes as we go through because I'm – I'm throwing in a lot of my notes into conversations of our top five so that I don't have as many notes at the end. Yeah, same here. <laughs> um, so my number three 
is one of my favorite moments of the episode, just because it is very reflective of a movie that I love. I want to talk a minute, and it's a very quick moment, but I want to talk a minute about that Incredibles moment that we got <laughs> from this episode. Oh, the image that I posted on Facebook for everybody to send feedback on. Oh, I didn't see that. All oh, I know that is that was I, amazing. All I know is that I screenshotted <laughs> it, and it is now my cover photo on Facebook. It's so amazing to have that, and that was definitely an Incredibles moment. Yeah. Oh, no, it correct. absolutely was. Like to see the entire family together striking the superhero pose, like getting ready to fight. Like the moment I saw that, even upon first viewing, I was like, "Yes, that is amazing." So I was so yeah. happy <laughs> to see that, and like, and just like in the Incredibles, that was one of those things, like. Like, you know, the, the Indian, just like in the Incredibles, the family is kind of separated, each doing their own thing. And then we get that moment where the family's together, they strike the pose, and then they're together as a family, fighting as a family. Yes. That's exactly what we got. Yeah. We, at the very end, this. we got that Incredibles moment where they, and I believe that Vision states it, boys, we haven't prepared you for this. And then Wanda goes, but you were born for this. But you were born for this. Yep. Yes. And, and it then, was perfect. And we get the kids taking care of the military. We get Wanda taking care of Agatha. We get Vision taking on White Vision. I mean, it is literally a family affair at this point. And it was, it was, it was amazing. So, I mean, it's a relatively quick number three, but I could not go without mentioning that Incredibles moment come from this episode. Awesome. Cool, cool, cool. My number three would be the scene after the battle and Wanda makes Agatha what she already created in that town and world. The character she made for herself. The, the role nosy she, neighbor. The nosy neighbor. So she locks Agatha in Westview at that point as that character. So I'm wondering how that spell will hold over time. And... The fact that we all know that she's going to wind up tapping Agatha at one point, and we oh, yeah. know that this is going to happen come Doctor Strange in a Multiverse of Madness at some point. Yeah, and I already mentioned it, but that was my number three. Yeah, I mean, that's like, yeah, that's that's just planting the seeds for something that's going to come into the future of this character. Oh, yes. But it's also interesting to note, too, that... You know, she puts Agatha under that spell to change her back to Agnes. That's a spell that's going to hold even after the hex comes down. Yeah. It's the only spell that's going to hold after the hex comes down. Yeah, because it's only one spell at that point. It's, she's not holding a whole town at that point. Yeah. And she's not controlling multiple people and influencing their minds and creating a whole world. And Agatha even foreshadows it herself when she tells Wanda, like, any spell that you cast can't be undone. So guess what? Like, it's <laughs> you just doomed yourself because yeah. now she just made you Agnes. And the only person that can undo that is her. Is her. Exactly. Because nobody else can undo it. Yeah. And she is the quote unquote Scarlet Witch. I want to praise Catherine Hahn for multiple things throughout this entire season because she's been amazing. Oh, she has been. But in that scene alone where she turns her to Agnes, man, like. That is some phenomenal acting by Catherine Hahn. Because if you look at that scene closely, she's got that smile on her face and she's doing the happy go lucky nosy neighbor thing. But you can just tell like it is a forced smile and there is pain in those eyes. So like it's almost like you can tell Agatha is trying to show through yeah. Agnes, but yeah. she can't because Agnes is the face that she's wearing. Exactly. For the fact that she actually states, oh, hi, hon. Yeah. Say that's some kind of get up. Is that or did you I, I leave the oven on and then, you know, the little bit of okie dokie artichokey. Exactly. <laughs> it's kind of forceful. Yeah. And it feels like it's forced, but you can see the pain in her face as oh, she's yeah. doing it. Too. She's, she's broken and it's brilliant acting on the part of Catherine Hahn. It really is. Yeah, she's definitely meant to be in this. And she's gone through multiple characters, if you think about it, within this particular season or this show as being the nosy neighbor. And then next thing you know, she is like, oh, should we take that again? Like an actress? 
and then she moves on to the the witch or the even the person that was entrapped with herb at the wall and she has the bicycle that looks like something out of the wizard of oz well but i mean and that's the thing too is we realize all along is that Every time I say all along, it just takes me right back to that song. We realized that the, the entire time, Agatha was never trapped. Agatha was in control the entire time, not of the hex. Like no. everything that happened, people under the under the spell, the hex itself, the television show, it was all Wanda. Wanda was doing everything. Oh, definitely. Agatha was pretty much somebody who saw the power that was being generated, knew what was causing it, and yep. infiltrated to take it. And take advantage of Wanda. And, and take advantage of it. And she wanted something from Wanda that we find out within this particular episode, She too. saw the power that it took to create everything, so she infiltrated it to steal the power. She was going to take she was going to take Wanda's power. Exactly. She wanted that power for herself because she already yep. sucked all the power out of all of her coven during that time that we see in that flashback from the last episode. Yeah. And she wants that for herself, but then she gets fearful because she knows it's the dark magic and the fact that Wanda doesn't even know about it. So she just wanted the power. She didn't want everything that was bound to it, which was interesting. Yeah, I mean, in a popular theory as well, uh, you know, throughout the whole thing was that this reason Wanda wasn't the one creating everything. It was somebody else and, you know, just leading Wanda to think she was in control. And that wasn't the case. Wanda was in, no. Wanda created everything. Subconsciously. In, yeah. And she was in control of everything. Yeah. To some degree. Agatha was basically just another vehicle. Uh, yeah. She was just another, another piece of the puzzle. Exactly. But she was a piece of the puzzle that wanted to take over the puzzle. Yeah. Somebody who's manipulative to seeing somebody else's uh, starting to decompose as a person mentally. Yeah, and that's literally what was going on with Wanda at that point. But Wanda wound up realizing it through all these issues within the world that she created, which is yeah. really crazy. Yeah, exactly. So you number two. All right, here's where we get into the deep stuff. There are a lot of things reflected in this episode. There are a lot of reflections in this episode. The first off, one of the for the first one, one of the most badass moments of the episode. Uh, in the very beginning, when Wanda and Agatha are facing off in the street after the kids run off into the house, and Wanda throws a car at Agatha. <laughs> That's a badass moment. Yes, and it's reflective of the Wizard of Oz. No, it's reflective of Age of Ultron. That's how As Wanda well. beat Tony. No, that's no. how she beat that's, Tony. That's the next part. Yeah, the that's Wizard the next of Oz part. is the yes. next part. Yeah, so she distracted Agatha with something and then threw a car on her back. Yeah, that's and, in my notes. <laughs> and that is from Age of Ultron. Age that of is Ultron. How she, that was, that was how, how she was able to subdue Tony. Correct. And the there's next, another version, The next too. part, yeah. the shoes under the car, yeah. or seeing the boots under the yeah. car. That's reflective of oh, the Wizard of Oz. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I talked about the Incredibles moment already, that pose. That was reflective of the Incredibles. I could have tied these together. I don't know why I didn't. So the other big reflection of this okay. uh, that I noticed in this one is Wanda and Vision's goodbye. Oh, that was so hard. It, it it's oh my god like like i said like the third time i watched it i cried like that, that was the that moment. was intense yeah. that 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 scene the writers did very well with those that and vision on vision but with oh man that vision on vision scene oh god like yes that, uh, we'll get into that with my number one yeah i'm talking more of the the ship of thesis moment yes yes okay all right yeah we'll get to that because i know that's your number one the Wanda and Vision goodbye. If you look at it, it is almost shot for shot, not not script wise, but positioning wise in when they look at each other to where they touch each other. It is almost shot for shot for Endgame. They are seen in Infinity War. Oh, Infinity War. Okay, yeah. Yes. When it first starts at the very end, before they go out and they get attacked. Yes. Yeah. 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 When they're getting ready to to split before they get attacked, Cap, 
Cap and yes. Widow and all of them come out. Yeah. Their goodbye is almost shot for shot that scene from Infinity War. It is. And the fact that in this case, there was no interruption. They were able to say their goodbyes in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And Vision understood where they were, him and the boys. And the fact that the way she states, uh, and he he said, we'll see. Uh, She goes, I'll see you again. And that was so upsetting because we know we're going to see those kids again. And we know we're going to see Vision again. For the fact that You know, we don't have conditional vision. We have white vision with an awareness. So, but I mean, you know, going back to the part of the reflectiveness of that scene and why it's so important is, you know, and you kind of touched on it a little bit is that really is the last time that Wanda and vision kind of have peace in their relationship because it's, it's from that moment on that all shit hits the fan. Yeah. And we get the moments of Infinity War and Vision being stabbed and Mm -hmm. having to remove the stone. And and, like that literally is that scene with them in London is the last moment of peace they have. So it makes sense that their goodbye in WandaVision is reflective of that scene because it is the last moment that they had together where they really were together. Well, and also they finally finished that conversation and had finally had found peace. And I think that's what was within Wanda's mind and within the Mind Stone is having peace within herself with the situation. That conversation in Infinity War wasn't really uh, a permanent goodbye like this one was. That was no, more no. like until... Because at that moment, during in that conversation in Infinity War, they were thinking of running away together. Yes, yeah. They were going to make a house and home and life. God, don't really. even bring up that scene. <laughs> that scene last week made me cry, too. Don't I even know bring that, that up. <laughs> Which is another reason I was kind of glad I wasn't on last week's podcast because I would have started crying when we were talking about it. But yeah, just like a lot of the reflections that shone through in different scenes for this were just, God, they're so stellar. And it, it like, it really, it really shows that, man, Marvel has their shit together when it comes to telling a story. And during COVID at the point, because at this point, when they filmed this particular episode, we were in the midst of full COVID lockdown. Yeah, but I think WandaVision was done shooting at that point. I think the ending scenes, because with Darcy and everything not being there, there was supposed to be more that was going involved. And they kind okay, of, maybe. they skewed it with the uh, the scripting at that point. There were certain scenes that weren't weren't shot specifically, so they were able to get them done and just do it creatively where, you know, they could get away with it. And it works. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, like I said, like it's it Marvel has their shit together when it comes to telling a story. And th- like this just it just proves it. Oh, definitely. It just proves it. That was your number two. That was my number two. Well, my number two would be the battle in the sky between Wanda and Agatha. Hell yeah. Uh, that was Extremely intense and similar to Ang Lee's The Hulk with the fight between the Absorbing Man and Hulk at the very end. If you we think don't, about we it. don't, we don't talk about that. Movie. I know we don't talk about that, but for <laughs> this, in this case, it's pretty much almost the scene for scene shot in a sense that Wanda stakes, you know, you want it, you take it. And, and then, you know, Agatha's saying, I'll take it all. And then she gets a shot and it goes towards the shield or the wall of the town. And she gets like, oh, and then she keeps taking, taking it. And then Wanda fakes the lack of power. And then we get all the symbols around that prevents Agatha from using her powers because it's something, the runes. And yeah, it's kind of foreshadowing because we got that from the last episode. So, you know, a fake out, but similar to the look of the uh, Ang Lee Hulk movie with the intensity of it all. You know, it's like, take it all. I don't want it. But at this point, it's like, no, I'm going to fake you out and I'm just going to take you down. And she does. Well, I mean, and yeah, I mean, it's fun when you go back and you rewatch that episode. Like the first time you're watching it, you're not really paying attention to the blasts that are missing Agatha. 
And it's not until the end of that battle when the runes show up on the yeah. hex that you realize, like, okay, that's why she was missing. Exactly. She, she was, was planting these runes. The, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like, she was <laughs> casting a spell on the hex. Like, she was missing in on purpose. And then when you go back and you rewatch that battle, like, you can tell, like, yep, that's what it was. That's where that rune is. That's where that rune was. Like, so... and. It's fun to go back and rewatch that, realizing because that shows how smart Wanda really is. And the feigning of the draining of energy from her and how, like, exhausted her body looked emaciated and kind of zombie-like at, at certain points. And it kind of gave hints to that with Marvel's zombies. With- I don't think we're ever going to get Marvel zombies. Oh, we are. And what if? Oh, what if? But that's an animated series. But I, I yeah. think that was kind of like an Easter egg to that, saying, oh, okay, well, because we got the Witches of Salem going after Wanda, after Agatha, you know, Wanda brings Agatha to that point. And I think that's exactly how Wanda knew how to make herself look. Yes. Because she saw the Witches yes. of Salem looking that way after yeah. being drained by Agatha. They were deadish looking. So drained. Wanda used yeah. that to her advantage. She made herself look that way. Exactly. She saw earlier on when Agatha was actually absorbing her power what happened to herself. Mm-hmm. So she put all these things yep. together. She made herself look this way, and it totally tricked Agatha. And it's, it's, it really does make. I mean, we've talked about this before in the past. I know we've talked about this in conversations too. Oh yeah. Wanda really is arguably one of the strongest superheroes in the Marvel Universe. Well, they kind of made that clear at during Endgame when Denai Guerrero goes, why was she up there? And she almost took down Thanos. Come on. But I mean, even still, yes, she almost took down Thanos alone, but that was just with a fraction of, of her, her abilities. Abilities and knowing about her abilities. She too. hasn't even tapped into her abilities yet exactly. at that point. So she can almost take down Thanos on her own then imagine how it would be now. Like, that's... Like it, it, Wanda she could is, just snap him out of existence at that point. <laughs> Wanda is arguably one of, if not the strongest superheroes in the Marvel Universe. Well, we already mentioned it, that she's like a Nexus being. And she's so, a Nexus being, yeah. So uh, she could easily create different multiverses, universes, bring people in at this point. And right now we're only a quarter of what she could do. Just think of what we get later on. I know. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> the multiverse of madness is going to be insane. It's going to be immensely insane. And who knows what we're going to encounter at that point. Just to finish up your point with the sky battle. Yeah. It was fun in the Halloween episode seeing Wanda wearing the comic book iteration of the costume. Of course. But the cost, but the Actual Scarlet Witch costume was really looks good. Bad ass. ass. Yeah, I I agree. And we actually got a teaser of that when we actually look at Disney Plus's or their advertisement on the actual episode because you could see it in a TV screen the week before. Well, because that was the vision that Wanda saw when she looked into the Mind Stone. Yes. So that was it. It was from two episodes ago. Yeah, no, you could see last episode. Last episode. Yeah, last episode. You could see it in the screen of her, and you could see partials yeah. of her costume. And then it comes it. to fruition. And yeah. it's it's funny too because I've I have purposely like Funko. I, you know me. I collect Funko Pops. I have a Same ton here. of them. And they released the Agatha Funko Pop, which I which I want. The White Vision Funko Pop, which I want. I have a Vision Funko Pop already. Cool. And, like, I, I'm a completionist, so, like, if I ordered Agatha and White Vision, I'm like, oh, well, I need Scarlet Witch then, too. Yes. Yeah, But the definitely. only Scarlet Witch one that was out was her and Vision in their Halloween costumes. So I was like, I, you know what? I'm not going to order them yet because I know I'm going to want a Scarlet Witch one. I'm going to wait and see if we're going to actually see what Scarlet Witch looks like by the end of the series. Because if they if we see it, I guarantee you Funko Pop is going to release a Funko Pop of it. And now that we've seen it, I'm literally just waiting with bated breath. I'm like, come on, Funko. They're going to do show it. Me, show me what that Funko Pop looks like because you know I'm going to buy it. It's and I'm, I'm going to buy it with, with Agatha and White Vision and I'm going to put them all together. Like, just, just do it already. It makes sense. And you know that's going to happen. Yeah. They, they market so well. 
So I'm just I'm just waiting for Funko to release the the Scarlet Witch Funko Pop from WandaVision because I will be clicking pre-order like almost immediately. <laughs> All right. So we'll move on to your number one. All right. My number one is actually more of a series as a whole. More pertaining to the end to to this, but as we you know we talked about at the at the top of the podcast our thoughts on everything and how people were disappointed when theories didn't come to fruition, and when I really sat down and I thought about it, what this show gave us was more it was better than what we would have gotten had a theory played out had Mephisto been involved or Nightmare been involved. What this series gave us it was in a series of nine episodes. It took two characters who are arguably are the are fan favorites for some, but not all. Yeah. It was it was always more Hulk, Captain America, Thor, mm-hmm. the Guardians, Iron Man. Like they were they were the mainstays. They were yeah. the ones that everybody's a favorite. This series took two secondary characters, put them to the forefront, and gave us a coherent and unique story for these characters that really pushed them to become fan fa- fan favorites like i would put scarlet witch and want uh, scarlet witch and vision on the same level as cap and iron man at this point after this series and when i say like what this show gave us is better than any theory having coming to fruition like i know people would have been like oh it would have been great if it brought mutants into the mcu well we're getting the mutants movie now so we don't really need wanda vision to have done that mephesto uh, yeah. he's he's kind of, well no that's what the mutants is they've already said it's pretty much the their version of the x-men yeah, well i well the rumor is is the idea of like feige the next movie that they're going to introduce the x-men are is going to be called the mutants that's what i said yeah yeah and and it was stanley's initial thoughts of doing x-men then that he was changed originally it. what the x-men was go- was going to exactly. be called exactly yeah. yeah but yeah they uh they're going to do that uh, it's kind of rumored but i really want to get an official release name of this that's what it's called it, it's official it's officially called the mutants okay all right yeah all right it's the origin story of the mutants in the mcu and it's paying homage to Stan Lee because that is what he wanted to call the X-Men originally was they were supposed to be called the mutants. So that is the official title of the movie is called the mutants. But again, going on my point of, you know, we don't need the mutants to have come from WandaVision like many me- people predicted. Um, we don't need Mephesto. Mephesto in reality, when you look at the way the MCU is formatted, eh, Mephesto is not really a character that fits. It also borders on the line of where China is in important because into of the this devil marketing yeah yeah and nightmare would probably suit more so but, within nightmare, this. but nightmare is also very similarly not a character that fits in the mcu he would he would True. be very campy yeah in, in but, the MCU. which makes me lead to think that it's more wanda than anything it's going to be the villain in the multiverse of madness oh but even that aside like we already we already talked about that what this show it didn't give us theories that we were predicting Instead, what it gave us was it took a character like Wanda and it gave her a solid future in the MCU. I think had, I mean, like one other prediction we had was that by the end of this, Vision would be alive. And in some cases, he He kind of is in White Vision. (laughs) I, I meant like the Vision that she created. Like, That's not we going to happen. We were, I know. You let me finish my points. Um, <laughs> it's like we had predicted that somehow he was going to step out of the hex and and he was going to be real, as were her kids. I kind of think it works out better that she had to say goodbye because she had to accept the grief that she was feeling. If Vision and the kids just stepped out of the hex – she would have never accepted the grief that she was feeling. Very true. She needed to accept the res- the the consequences of what had happened in from Endgame and Infinity War. She had to accept the grief that she was feeling because it was important to her and her and the building of her character. It would have been a complete cop out to just give her everything she wanted in the end. She needed to feel this loss. In the end, in order for her character to become stronger, 
That she did, and yeah, like you said, yeah, she needed to feel the acceptance of a loss of vision. There, there was closure at this point. That's literally what we're talking about is closure with her. Yes. And now with that being all said and done, with that end credit scene, something else is amiss, and something else is involved because we do get, and I will go into my end credit scene comparison to The Incredible Hulk, where she's living on a, in a cabin alone, and there's been X amount of days without incident, but yet she's in the background playing with the Darkhold book, and she hears the kids scream out, most likely Billy, screaming, Mom, Mom, we need you. And we see three lights in her eyes, and something is taking hold within that world, wherever she's reading that book. Oh, she's on the astral plane. Oh, definitely. Yeah. She's not in another world. She's on the astral plane. I mean, we've seen the S Sorcerer Supreme do this, and we've seen Strange, who actually is the new Sorcerer Supreme, do this as well. I mean, this is something that wizards and witches do. She's on the astral plane reading the Darkhold. Oh, yeah. So I, I don't really think there's a comparison to Hulk in this. This is just my opinion. I think, I mean, there's a similarity in the way the shot and the scene was formatted. Yes. Um, but as far as story relation, I don't think there's any, any no, relation No, story to relation, yeah. no. No, just the scene itself. Yeah, you're right. And, the scene and is very, very similar to almost like Evil way. Dead too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and she's tapped into some dark powers at that point reading the Darkhold. So I think that right there, like we've been, We've been told over and over again that WandaVision is a lead in to Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. W that was it. Yeah. That yeah. was that was the tie in. That's right literally there. what this whole show was all about was a lead in. And the uh five stages of grief within Wanda and how she had to deal with them and then progress as a character. It's pretty much uh a, a character build up. Well, I mean, it, in essence, the tie-in to Doctor Strange was literally the last 30 seconds. It was, that, yeah. it, it was that after credit scene. <laughs> yeah. Nine episodes, the nine episodes before that were nothing more than to build and strengthen Wanda as a character so that she was the character she needs to be going into Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Yeah. Yeah. A character that we really didn't really, we took for granted in the films ever since Age of Ultron. Yes. If you think about it. And the only time we got to see her pure power was at the end of Endgame when he goes, who are you? And that you was know, coming out of nothing but pure anger. That was. Yeah. And the fact that we, we finally did get to see her fly and all that cool stuff and She's literally was keep able to keep Thanos at bay. Yeah. And then him having to rain down firepower from the sky. Oh, it's the only way he could stop her. He could stop her at that point, showing, hey, this person has a freaking ton of power. And he was like, just launch it all. <laughs> and that was it. And he goes, I don't know who you are. You know, because that was the Thanos of the past at that point. Yeah. Yeah, and and it's it, it shows that they're kind of doing a lot of character development with certain characters, which is pretty cool, especially with Wanda. I'm hoping more Vision, because even with Vision, it's, it's kind of limited, and I'm hoping that with uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, White Vision does come back, and that way he... Oh, we have not seen the end of Vision. Oh, we have not seen the end of that Vision. So, uh, let, let's move on to your number one. That was my number one. Oh, that was your number one. Yes. Okay, well, my number one was <laughs> conditional vision on white vision and the whole conversation about the ship of Theseus and their battle throughout the episode, you know, and conditional vision giving all the data back to white vision with just a touch. And the fact that they both feel that they're both part of or a part of vision at that oh, point. Oh, I just remembered some of my other comparisons. Do it. Because you just brought them up. Um, I'll make them real quick because one of them is actually in that scene. Um, so the other two comparisons I just remembered, uh, when we first see White Vision appear and he picks up um, Wanda 
by the head to kind of try to crush yeah, her head. Very similar to Ultron, right? Very similar to Ultron, yes. Um, and then in that scene with Vision versus Vision, or Double Vision, as I call it. Um, double Vision. <laughs> when he touches him and gives him, you know, restores those memories, and we see the yellow that happens, that's another Vision versus Ultron moment. Yes, it is. That we kind of get. Because yeah. when he gives Ultron the memories, that's kind of what it... It's it's that that flash of yellow, yeah. So yeah. that was it. Yeah, uh, uh, the last part I would uh, I just love the action within it, and Paul Bettany was brilliant in both parts and within that episode, White Vision and Conditional Vision. He yes. did a great job. Yeah, you know he kind of teased us, and the day before the episode shows up on Good Morning America, he goes, "Yeah, the actor I always wanted to play was yeah, I was trolling <laughs> you guys." It was myself. <laughs> cheeky, cheeky British bastard. Cheeky bastard. <laughs> but we love you. Oh, God, I said that. I think you are now one of my new favorite people ever. Well, he's always been my favorite. He married Jennifer Connelly, and now she's well, in Snowpiercer. <laughs> well, not only that, but he, I, I love him in A Night's Tale, too. Like, A Night's oh, Tale. Oh, I is love one of, A Night's Tale. You and I both love a that. Night, yeah, that's like one of my favorite movies. So, <laughs> yeah, same here. You know, I've been, and there's a very popular meme going around right now. It's like, you guys know Paul Bettany from this, and it's a picture of Vision. And it's like, I know him from this, and it's a picture of him naked in A Night's Tale. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, that's accurate because that's where I know Paul Bettany from. Shot, by the way, too. But because <laughs> I mean that's that's accurate because that is exactly where I know him from. Okay, well, I think that covered all our top five. So let's move into some notes. So I have a few, a bunch. Holy crap! I still have a bunch. <laughs> uh, what do you have as far as notes? I still have a few. Okay. All right. You want to start with your first one? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, let's see. I don't really have to mention the Darkhold because we kind of already talked about that. Yeah, the Darkhold is pretty much something that we've already talked um, about. I Actually, you know what? I'm looking at my list. I really don't have many more. Um, one of them's a quote, so I can save that for the next one. Um, double vision, and the, we didn't really talk much about the Ship of Theosis, but that's it, I, all I will say about the Ship of Theosis is that. It is, it really is a really great, really great philosophical look at things. Um, if you are curious more about it, look it up and read it. Oh, it's an amazing read. It's, it's an amazing philosophical yeah, conundrum. It is. Um, the only other two things I have are, um, I, I think it was great that Dottie turned out to be a red herring the entire series. I have more about Dottie. Okay. Uh, yeah, people predicting that Dottie was someone important, and she really, really wasn't. She was just another... No, she was just she, uh, she somebody was just that Sarah. was playing a role. Yep, she was just Sarah playing a role. Um, Here's the here's my final note, and then I'll turn it back over to you. Um, We both predicted a scroll being part of this, but we were <laughs> wrong in who Way it was. Us. <laughs> um, you were... I know I initially predicted Hayward, so did you. Yep. You stuck with Hayward, and I kind of changed my mind. I was like, no, nah, I really don't think Hayward is a scroll. Yeah. Um, it was Slippy, Slappy, Swanson... Swami... Samsonite. Oh, Samsonite. <laughs> um, it turned out there was a scroll um, who did not come in until the end, and it was the FBI agent who pulled Monica into the theater. Um for a higher calling, as I say in quotations. Yeah. Um, we had, we, I'm pretty confident we have seen the planting of the seed of Monica's next step in her journey. Yeah. She, they did a lot of character development within this movie too. Not only with Photon or Monica Rambo, but also with Darcy. But sadly enough, we didn't see her at the very end because she did predict it. You're going to jail. That's my quote. Have fun in prison. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I love that. Darcy's amazing and fun. But due to COVID restrictions, apparently uh, apparently she couldn't really do too much. So they just shot that as a quick one-off because of yeah. the distancing. So that was pretty cool. Well, they only had to just put her in the seat of a car and film her saying one line. Yeah, pretty much. And then that was it. <laughs> 
All right. Well, as a, an overall for the show, in my opinion, it has the same feels of The Wizard of Oz. It goes from black and white to color and a story about a woman from the real world that goes into another world where people on the other side have different names and heroes have to come to deal with a witch at a certain point. So pretty much it kind of mimics the Wizard of Oz to some degree, even though there's two witches in this. And it doesn't go back to black and white. Exactly. That's the weird part. Yep. It just goes to static, if you think about it. <laughs> it goes to astral plane. That is true. That is true. One other would be the marquee on the movie theater. Reads, yes, I'm so glad you brought that up because Oz I the forgot to. Powerful. Oh, no, that's not the one I'm thinking of. Oh, it's the Sam Raimi movie. Am I wrong with the name? Oh, no, no, no. There is a much, much bigger Easter egg on the marquee of the movie theater. Okay, you're talking about the Blade Runner one that yes. I mentioned last week? Okay. All right, okay, good. so you... you Well, was that in last... I didn't think it was in last week's episode. I thought it was just in this week's episode. I mentioned it last week. Oh, but it, but it didn't show up in last week's episode. It did. Oh, it did? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you could talk about it. Go ahead. No, no, no. If you already brought it up last week, I yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I yeah. only heard people talk about it this week. No, no, no. We talked about it last week, Damien and I. I actually okay. brought it up. Uh, it was Rutger Hauer's speech within Ten Hauser. Yeah, the Ten Hauser Gate. Yeah, yeah. Ten Hauser Gate put the fun in dysfunction. And the fact that you know, you know, Rutger Hauer's character was pretty much a cyborg that was dealing with his own realization of life and kind of like Vision. And having those issues. Yeah. It was, it's from the tears in the rain speech from Blade Runner. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and this week it was the, the marquee of the movie theater reads, Oz the Great and All Powerful, which Sam Raimi, it, it, which was a Sam Raimi movie about the Oz before Dorothy. Plus Raimi is doing Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. I didn't catch Oz on the marquee at all. Oh. I, I'm not saying it's not there. I'm just it's saying there. I didn't. It's there. You got to pause it. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying I didn't. Was it at the end, like when it when the, the when everything starts flickering? changing? Yeah, yeah, everything's okay. flickering. You got to do it really quick. All right, I'm gonna have to go back and look for it. So uh, the white vision that we got was similar to the West Coast Adventures issues 43 to 45, and Evil Vision was set up. set up to make Wanda suffer and is wiped off of his memories and Wanda reprogrammed to basically destroy her within this episode. But it within the comic, it literally was just a uh, vision, just trying to run away from everything. <laughs> you know, he mm -hmm. didn't want to be involved with the real world. He didn't want to know the kids. He didn't want to know Wanda. He was kind of a little bit evil in that same regard. All right. And then we got Dennis the Mailman says, don't shoot. I'm just the messenger. I'm just the messenger. And the <laughs> same line he says in the second episode, he's driving a Presto messenger van and there's a rabbit as the logo, similar to what magicians use in their acts. Well, but, we've seen the Presto van before. Yeah, we have. Yeah. But this is more emphatic and the fact that it's kind of like a redundant thing. And lastly, Agatha states to Wanda, do you know that there is a chapter in a dark hole dedicated to her? Uh, you know, it's like ded dedicated to Wanda and the dark hole, which you Ben stated about in the last time we podcasted about this. You know, we, we meant you mentioned it about that was the book that was missing from Strange's bookshelf. Yep. Yep. And the squeaky shine billboard behind Agatha reads, all natural formula using the power of Mother Earth, which references to a bunch of, like, if you, if you look at Wiccans, their use of using the Earth's natural energy for their power, if you think about it. Did you notice, too, that Agatha's fingers were black in this one, too? Which so is also were Wanda's at certain points too. Well, no, but Wa Agatha's were uh, Wanda's were kind of were her whole hands, and they were drained. So they were like really frail. They were, dead. They, they were frail and dead. Yeah, Agatha's were literally black, pointy tipped, hmm. which is another interesting. It's which is another characteristic of witches. 
Uh, does that remind you of what, what's his name? A Mog from Endgame and in Infinity Wars. Remember, he was using the magic on Strange at that point. Didn't he have those same tips? Oh, I don't know. I'd have to and look. claws. I did, however, while you were talking, go look at WandaVision. And indeed, you're right. There's Oz the Great and Powerful, as well as another flash through the marquee is now showing Big Red. Yeah, we mentioned that last week, too. Okay. And Kidnapped, which was the other one that was with it. So, Which was from reference to Vision. Yes. Big Red. Yep. yep. And when Wanda uses her mind powers on Agatha to get into her brain and go back to the time of her coven, her coven they had her at the stake. Uh, that was a reference to the Age of Ultron when Wanda did that to all of the Avengers while working with Ultron. Pretty much very evil, if you remember that particular scene. Very much like when she comes right up behind Tony in just a little spell, and he has that vision of nightmares. Mm -hmm. Similar to with uh, Banner, when he, he gets Rage Hulk out of him. Yep. Then little Billy pulls a, a whole Neo from the Matrix <laughs> when one of Hayward's bullets gets passed by Monica. Nice trick, kid. Yeah, that was pretty cool. And the fact that we do get to see Photon's powers. Monica gets the Photon power, which is pretty cool. And Well, we, she's already had it. We just, we're it, just letting her see her use it. At this point, we're, we're seeing more, and it's like yeah, it's just giving us more fuel for the fire to like well, that's, we want to see more well that's what i said in the beginning of the podcast too like my as my number five or my number four yeah you know seeing her eyes turn yellow because she's interacting with the kinetic energy here's a little thing i went a little bit deep diving well dotty's name is sarah and a lot of people have started looking into this and these are deep dives Sarah Proctor was uh, a real witch that was put on trial back in the Salem Witch Trials. So a lot of people are equating this to her. And Sarah Proctor back then during the Salem Witch Trials was put on trial. And her father had to pay the price with his life for his daughter. So a lot of people are equating that with that, which is pretty interesting. It's interesting. But again, we've, like I said in the top... This is a show that many people have over theorized about. Oh, definitely. I, I get yeah, like I, the I whole like oh, it let's I thought look it was a funny. let's they make a deep dive into Sarah. No, let's really not. Let's the show not. is over. There's nothing more to Sarah other than she was just somebody in the town. Exactly. Like, and I like to feel that way too. Yeah. Emma Caulfield was really good though. I love the fact that and we got And she more. has even come out and said in an interview now that the series is over what it was like to be a red herring. She, she herself has admitted there's nothing yeah. more to her character than just being someone who was trapped in the town. Yeah. So, but yet people are continue to, are going to continue to theorize when there's nothing to theorize about. Yeah, exactly. But we have fun having yeah. all these little series that we all do. But uh, I ended it at that because we already talked about like the ending Hulk, Incredible Hulk scene and the Evil Dead with the Book of the Dead. <laughs> Even though it's the Book of Darkhold at this point. So with that, we're going to move into quotes. So I'm pretty sure you have a ton. No, I really had the one and you already said it. Oh, damn, dude. Have fun going to prison. <laughs> <laughs> or have fun in prison. All right. Well, I have That's a it. bunch. So I Agatha states, I, I take power from the undeserving. It's kind of my thing, you know, and that's pretty much literally what she does. And then another one from Agus, Agatha saying, she is just your meat puppet. I just cut her strings, Wanda. Harkens back to Age of Ultron. I got no strings. I have no me. strings on me. Yep. So uh, that was when she cut Dottie of Wanda's spell. And then there's a difference between you and me. And that's this is Wanda saying there's a difference between you and me. You did this on purpose. And then Wanda and Selim after she hexes Agatha, putting her on the pole. And then uh, Vision saying, boys, your mother and I never prepared you for this. And then Wanda goes, but you were born for this. And we we already talked about that. And then, of course, the Hi Hun. Hi Hun. Say, that's some kind of get up. Is that <laughs> that you or did I leave the oven on? <laughs> <laughs> it's so cute. Yeah, you know, Catherine Hahn was so great. With She's this, fantastic in this series. As far as like creating different characters, even though they're the same character, but manipulating. 
I just like the fact that a witch talks about an oven reference. Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> That's just fun. Hey, go watch Gretel and Hansel, everybody. <laughs> or yeah, or the other way around, Hansel and Gretel. No, there was a movie oh, called Oh, that's right. There's a Hansel. movie called Gretel and Gretel. That's right. That's and it right. does have Jeremy Renner in it. Um <laughs> But that that was it for quotes. Uh you already spoke about we already talked about it and you brought it up about mutants, uh that being the name of the next Mm-hmm. Marvel product that they're talking about to to get the X Men into the Marvel MCU, so that would be amazing. Can't wait for that to happen. So, uh, podcast recommendations uh, will bypass if unless you have something, Ben. I don't really think I do. I kind of I already talked about the. Uh, I think two weeks ago I talked about the Office deep dive and how did this get made? Yeah, and Greg talked about Unspooled. Already, yeah, I'm good. I, uh, I don't really have any other podcast recommendations at, at this time. I would have to state that I would definitely recommend DC Primetime. They're still uh, available on the Next Level online network, so you could hear Ben and his co-hosts, and they they talk about the whole DC CW series, the Arrowverse stuff, the Arrowverse yeah. as it were. So you get the Flash, Legends of Tomorrow, Arrow. Everything up until uh, Crisis, Final Crisis. Yeah, and Crisis on Infinite Earths was our uh, was our finale. So I I recommend that for you guys who are still watching Flash, Legends, all that good stuff. Go back the the episodes are still up and just go follow that on the Next Level Online Network. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean if you're if you're still watching the Flash and everything, and you're relatively new to those shows, and you need kind of. Uh, an explanation as to things that have happened in the past and you don't want to go back and rewatch the entire like gambit of all the episodes. Uh, you can always <laughs> check out the podcast because we, we broke it down for years. So yeah, it's still there and you could follow each episode. If you're just starting out and you don't want to follow it per episode, just listen to Ben and his co-host and me and Rob. Uh, yep. And have fun with that. So with that, you could submit your feedback to our website, which would be www.panelstopixelspodcast.com, which will redirect you to our Facebook page, which would be facebook.com slash panels to pixels. And you could just leave a uh, comment during the, uh, the post that we put in every week. So we will put in a picture, an image of what we're covering per week. And obviously with WandaVision, we were putting it for an image per week. So that way you guys could put in some sort of feedback within that. Same thing with Snowpiercer with Steve, which he's covering with Daphne. And then if you wanted, you could always just send an email, regular email at panels to pixels one at gmail.com. And that's panels and two is spelt out T O pixels and the number one at gmail.com. And then you could easily just leave a voicemail just record your voice and just send it as an attachment and we'll play it, which I will be doing soon. And with that, you could hear us on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast player of choice at this point. And we could also be found on YouTube. So we're going to move into what I call feedback. And we got some feedback from Steve Brown. Hey, of course we did. <laughs> so... <laughs> You're going to hear what Steve has to say. Steve hasn't been on this whole time, or uh, actually since the first episode, I think. <laughs> so, well, he's, he's busy doing the Panels to Pixels Part 1A or Part 1B or whatever you're calling it, the Snowpiercer. <laughs> he's doing Snowpiercer with Daphne. Yes. So with that, we're going we're gonna to be playing his, uh, his information. So, all day. <laughs> Just your shoes. Like the, the Wicked Witch of the West, get it? It's a car and a house, yeah. Hey, it's Steve. Um, welcome, panelers. Uh, uh, can't wait to hear Mark and Ben, and if they bring in a special guest, uh, break this one down for y'all. I'm going to give a, th- a few thoughts after I watch it for the second time. <laughs> Boner. Although that was a kind of a funny <laughs> joke. The reveal of Ralph is a little, I don't know, is it anticlimactic? It, it, is he's supposed to be her husband because that's how she's referred to Ralph this entire time. I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure I get it. 
this conversational battle between what did he call himself? Uh, conditional vision and white vision is great. And I love the way it concludes. That is a sexy looking Elizabeth Olsen right there. In that <laughs> Scarlet Witch with the red hair and the eyes and the, I strangely turned on. Should I say that out loud? Actually, it's not outside the realm of possibility, Catherine Hahn and Evan Peters. It's only 14 years difference. And I mean, compared to Paul Bettany and Elizabeth Olsen, 18 years difference. So, you know, I can see it. Well, with the five stages of grief, we finally have acceptance. But I did love the line, we said goodbye before, we'll say hello again. And I get choked up just saying it. No, please stand by. So I guess this really is the series finale. I'm going to watch the mid-credit and the uh, after-credit scenes again. But uh, can't wait to hear you guys talk about this one. Because I know there's a lot to break down. And there's a lot uh, that I missed that I'm sure you guys will help me out with. All right. Talk to you later. <laughs> I, uh, you know what? I forgot about the whole no please stand by part of that. Yeah. Like, he's right. Yeah, there's no please stand by at the end of that one. So there's no, like, to be continued. Exactly. At the end of this one. And Steve, I'm right there with you. Uh, Elizabeth Olsen looks amazing as Carly Witch. Oh, she does. And I I'm... love that ending scene, that costume. That was amazing. Goes from a hoodie with a jacket over it to that leather style with the tiara, too. But at the very end, we don't see the tiara. We only see that when she's in that realm with the book. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, all I'm saying is Funko, get on it. <laughs> I'm sure they are on it. <laughs> I, I want that pop. So with that, that's how you send feedback, listeners. So if you want to do that, you could do the same and we'll play it. We'll actually play your feed or read your feedback if you do that through Facebook or email. And well, with that, where can listeners hear us? So Ben, where can they hear you? Easiest way is to go to the next level network.com. And from there, you can find links to all of my podcasts, uh, including the spotlight with Ben Beck, uh, lost. We have uh, lost. Re uh, we have to go back. Lost revisited. I'm getting tongue tied on my own title. Uh, and the soon to be launched Wilhelm podcast, which is, I promise launching by the end of the month. I'm sure it I, will. like I have no, I, I just, I got really tied up with convention stuff. <laughs> Cause we got some big stuff happening on Plug the convention. That if you want. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's not happening probably until September of next year at this point because of obviously the world being in the state that it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's a new convention call coming called Phenomicon, which is a, a, a all out everything pop culture convention. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of cool stuff in the works right now that we're working on that kind of, I had to put the Wilhelm podcast kind of to the side for a minute. Because there were some some immediate things that needed to be done with Phenomicon in order to make sure they happen. But now that that's happening, we're going to be finally launching Wilhelm. Like I said, by the end of this month, you will see Wilhelm live. And you can actually already subscribe to it now. Yep. So that you can... Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Yeah. Facebook.com slash the Wilhelm podcast, Instagram and Twitter at the Wilhelm pod, the Wilhelm podcast dot at gmail.com is the email. If you just go to wherever you can find podcasts, that be Apple, Spotify, Amazon, anywhere, uh, and just search Wilhelm, you will see the podcast and you can subscribe to it now. There is a trailer out that makes it possible to subscribe. Awesome. So, Subscribe to it now, and then when those new episodes start dropping, you'll uh, you'll immediately start getting them. Which I have to apologize, listeners, too, because I said to Wilhelm scream last <laughs> week. So yeah, I yeah, Ben, I wanted Ben to correct me. So you're on the right track. I mean, that's what it's based <laughs> off of is the Wilhelm scream. So that's why it's called Wilhelm. Yeah. So I always think of it as Wilhelm scream. I, I know. I appreciate you plugging it when head. I wasn't there. So. With that, I can be found right here on Pounds the Pixels on the Next Level Network, doing what I do every week, as well as sending any feedback I can when I can to my friends that do podcasts. I could also be found on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast on the Pirate Core Entertainment Network. And yeah, check that out. Uh, this week, you'll get Red Dawn. It's coming out, so that will be coming up. I'm working on Highlander 1986. Nice. So uh, I might have a plethora of people, depending on how many people want to jump on on that. And I know you and I are going to be doing face-off soon. Eventually, yep. Eventually. We will be doing face-off. So 
you can. If you want more, Ben Beck, you just come on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast and you hear him there. And I'm sure there's going to be another movie. <laughs> and we got a lot of great feedback on our rock episode, too. Oh, yeah. We did. <laughs> we kept telling people how fun that was, and everybody was like, yeah, that was a lot of fun. A lot of people enjoyed it. They loved our bad... Our bad Sean Connery impression. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's all right. It's just going to go from bad Sean Connery impressions to bad Nick Cage impressions. So it's... I mean, we could have done bad Nick Cage impressions during The Rock, but Connery was just so much easier. Oh, it is. Now it's going to be uh, Cage and uh, Travolta. <laughs> or Cage doing... Nolte. Or Cage doing Travolta. Yeah. It's and bad and Travolta doing Cage. <laughs> it's bad impressions of us doing Nicolas Cage doing John Travolta, or bad impressions of us doing John Travolta doing Nicolas Cage. Wow, there's so many layers to this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a world in a world in a world. <laughs> it's, an, it's a podcast inception. Uh, there it is. All right. So with that, I just want to thank everybody for listening. I'm Mark. I'm Ben. And this was Panels to Pixels, and we'll see you on the next panel. See ya. Talk to you guys later.